Once you've made a plaster mold, it's time for slip casting. If you don't know how to make your own plaster mold, I have a couple of videos on that, which I will link to below. It is important that your mold is thoroughly dry before you do this. Simply rubber band your mold together snugly. You can buy specialty mold rubber bands that are gigantic. Then pour in the casting slip, which is not ordinary joinery slip. This is actually very important, so I'll come back to it. And then leave the casting slip in the mold for a certain amount of time. Every mold is different, so you have to get to know your mold. Mine take anywhere from 20 to 30 to sometimes 40 minutes. This particular mold takes 20 minutes. After allowing my slip to sit in the mold for 20 minutes, I then pour the excess slip out. The longer you allow your slip to sit in the mold, the thicker the clay walls will be. I will explain how this works in greater detail in a few minutes. When pouring the slip out of the mold, you generally want to pour it out gently as to not create an air vacuum. If your slip glugs out and creates a vacuum, it might suck the clay wall inside the mold, causing an inward vent. In all my experiences with slip casting, this has only happened to me once. Once the majority of the slip is out, I like to really shake it out with this particular mold. That is because I have some really thin hummingbird wings, which makes it difficult to get all the slip out. I then leave the mold upside down for a few minutes to allow the rest of the slip to drain out. Then I turn it right side up as to aid in the drying process. At this stage, you should remove excess slip from the top of the mold. If you do not do this, sometimes it causes the piece inside to crack. This is usually because the slip on the top gets hung up on the plaster and as it begins to shrink, it can't free itself from the plaster and then cracks. This crack can then creep all the way into your mold, so best to get rid of it. It is important to let the very wet clay inside the mold dry a bit until it becomes leather hard. If you try to open the mold too soon, the clay piece inside will rip in half. Again, every mold is different. Some take a couple of hours and some may take six or more hours. This mold here only took about two hours until the clay piece inside was dry enough to hold together when opening the mold. You know it is safe to open the mold when you see the clay wall stiffens, shrinks, and separates from the plaster. Sometimes they get a little impatient and don't wait for the sign. For those instances, I simply rock the mold back and forth to see if it will free itself. You can feel it when it does this. If it does, you can then remove one side of the plaster mold. If you are forcing it to release this quickly, as I did, it's best to leave the clay piece inside the mold for a few minutes before removing. This will give them time to dry and shrink a little bit. As it shrinks, it releases itself. But if you are impatient like me, you might be able to remove them a little more quickly. If they are not readily releasing, you can sometimes force them out by pounding on the mold with your fist. This usually causes it to bounce right out. This is because of Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you're still having trouble releasing the piece from a mold, you can use an air compressor. I usually keep my air compressor anywhere between 60 to 80 PSI. You just point the compressed air at the seam and it'll blow right out. Works like a charm. I will get back to putting all the pieces of my hummingbird together later in this video. But first I want to talk about other shapes of molds very briefly. Some molds are easier to use than others. The hummingbird mold is pretty easy. It casts fast, the piece inside dries quickly, and once the mold is open, the clay hummingbird releases itself quite readily, especially if you give it just a little time to shrink and release itself. However, the mold I made of this flower is very difficult due, the, due to the shape of the flower and the fact that I am casting both sides of the flower. The slip casting process works the same as usual, but you will notice I am using fabric straps to hold the mold together rather than rubber bands. This is because the mold is big and heavy and the rubber bands are not up to the job. Again, the process is the same. I pour the slip in and for this mold, I leave the slip in for about an hour. Since the slip remains in this mold for such a long time, I have to keep topping off the mold with more slip as the mold continues to suck out the water. I then pour out the excess slip, allow the slip inside the mold to set up for several hours, and then open the mold. The problem with this mold is how difficult it is to release the flower inside. I am again being a little impatient. If I waited a little longer, I would not have needed an air compressor to open the mold. As you can see, the bottom of the flower mold released relatively easily from the plaster. This is because the flower shrank away from the plaster, releasing itself. However, the top of the flower is very difficult to release from the mold. 
This is because of the shape of the mold. Because clay shrinks as it dries, the clay flour actually grabs and tightens to this convex portion of the mold. If I wait too long to remove the clay flour from the mold, the flour will begin to dry and thereby shrink. As it shrinks and grabs tighter to this convex portion of the mold, it then begins to crack. Both the convex shape along with all the texture prevents the clay from separating itself. So with this mold, I know there is a small window of opportunity to successfully release the flour from the mold. I must open it as soon as the clay inside is firm enough not to tear, but not too firm that it begins to shrink and crack around the plaster. In order to cast this piece, I do need an air compressor to release and blow the flour out. If you look closely, you will see there is still a little bit of cracking that is starting to happen. But this is easy to remedy with a casting slip, simply by painting the same casting slip into the cracks. So you then think, wow, I don't want to make a mold of a bull because I will run into the same problem. Not so. A bull mold is only a one-piece mold, meaning you do not need to cast both sides. As you can see, casting the outside telegraphs to the inside. It is probably the easiest type of mold to make and slip cast. Okay, so now I will quickly run through the process of putting the pieces of the hummingbird back together and get back to the big difference between casting slip and normal joinery slip. At the end of this video, I will show a piece of artwork I made using this hummingbird. When putting the hummingbird together, there is not much to it. As usual, all the pieces should have the same moisture content so that they do not shrink at different rates and thereby crack. Simply score and slip as usual when you put your pieces together. I use the same casting slip when attaching the pieces. To make a clay coil, I simply use a leftover scrap, dip it into water to rehydrate, and then roll it into coils. The way slip casting works is that the plaster mold acts like a gigantic sponge. It sucks the water out of the slip and turns it into clay against the plaster wall. The plaster draws the water out of the slip evenly and consistently. That is, given that your mold is equal in size and density on both sides, which I explain in my mold making video linked below. Because the plaster draws the water out evenly and consistently, it creates a perfectly uniform clay wall with no deviation in thickness. In order for this to work, your mold needs to be dry. If your mold is wet, it does not make a very good sponge. The most important thing you need to understand when slip casting is that you do not use ordinary slip. In the ceramic studio, we use slip all the time. Usually I refer to this slip as joinery slip. Joinery slip is simply clay mixed with water until it becomes runny, and we use this slip to join two pieces of leather hard clay together, sort of like glue. This is not the kind of slip we use when slip casting. Instead of thinning the clay with water to make it runny, we thin it with deflocculants and a small amount of water. You say, what the heck does deflocculant mean? I'm sorry, but this is a bit of a long answer, but I will make it easy to understand. The reason clay is malleable, or what we refer to in the biz as plastic, is because all the clay particles are magnetically charged. Each clay molecule is shaped sort of like a plate, with one side of the particle having a negative charge and the other side having a positive charge. They magnetically bond, or what I like to say, flock together, sort of like a flock of birds. This is the exact opposite of deflocculant. Deflocculants deflock the particles, meaning it renders the clay particles magnetically the same. Have you ever tried to put two magnets together only to have them repel? And then when you flip them around, they stuck together? That is because opposite charges attract to each other while the same charge repels. This works the same with clay. Therefore, in order to deflocculate the clay particles, we need to render the, magnet, the magnetic charge of the particles all the same. We need to get the clay particles to not attract or stick together. When we add a deflocculant to the slip, it will alter all the clay particles, giving them the same magnetic charge, resulting in slip that instantly thins since the clay particles are now repelling each other. It's really fun to watch because it happens instantly. The flocculants come in the form of sodium silicate, soda ash, barium, and darvin. I will come back to the deflocculants in a minute. When we slip cast, we do not want the clay particles in our slip to flock together. We need them to deflocculate. Why? There are two reasons. The first reason we deflocculate our slip is to thin our slip by using half of the water that it would normally take to make a slip runny. That's right, by making the clay particles deflock, 
we actually create a very runny slip with half the water we normally would need. It's like magic. You say, who cares? Why does this matter? I just want to thin my clay with water. No, you don't. What happens to clay when it dries? It shrinks. The higher the water content, the more the clay shrinks. The more the clay shrinks, the more it cracks. The other very important reason we deflocculate the casting slip is to render all the magnetically charged clay particles with the same magnetic charge. Just like magnets that have the same charge, the clay particles, once deflocculated, will now repel one another. When they repel each other, the particles are suspended evenly and consistently, meaning the heavier particles are not settling to the bottom of the mold. If the particles settle, your slip cast piece would have thicker walls where the heavier particles settled and thinner walls where the lighter particles were suspended. By deflocculating, we avoid this problem altogether, as all the particles are repelling and bouncing off each other and suspending equally away from one another, thus creating a perfectly even and consistent wall thickness. Now that you understand that your casting slip needs to be deflocculated, you will wonder how to do this. Deflocculating your slip is not difficult, but it is a whole other topic in and of itself, which I will leave for another day. Because of this, I have linked below to an article on how to deflocculate your own clay body to utilize for slip casting. I will also link to an excellent book that goes into great detail about how to make various kinds of plaster molds, slip casting, deflocculation, recipes, and troubleshooting. That being said, you can deflocculate many different kinds of clay bodies, but those heavy and grog do not do well. You can also purchase either dry or liquid casting slip. If you purchase dry casting slip, it will come with instructions on how to mix it as you will need to add the deflocculants yourself. I originally made this hummingbird mold for my piece titled Sweet Somethings. To see more of my work, visit my website.